Hey, welcome to Flatirons, everybody. We are really glad you're here. We're diving into our Sermon on the Mount series called Times Are Changing. And if you have any questions through this process, you can always go to flatironschurch.com and let us know what questions you have, your thoughts, anything like that. Again, thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. So good. So uh, let me, that, I like that song, and I've only, I've, I've only known about that song for six days. Let me explain, because I get asked questions a lot, like, so how do you pick out songs, and how do you know what songs you're going to do, stuff like that. So, um, so usually we have, like, this, uh, our staff gets together and goes, so, you know, this is where Jim's going with the message. How about this song? How about this song? How about this song? The other way that we get new songs is, is that you guys will email me song ideas. And I'm going to be honest with you, most of them suck. They're just bad. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and you know who you are. We're just never going to do that. And so, but, but here's the other way. It's just personal conversations I have with people. So, so last weekend, and maybe you're here, uh, last weekend, the last service, um, so I, after doing, you know, four services and, and a couple retreats and stuff like that, at the end of the service last weekend, I was just tired. I just wanted to, I just wanted to go home and sit in my chair and watch football because I'm a Christian. So that's what I wanted to do. And so, and so my truck's parked out back of this building. And so I looked out and I thought I can make it. And so I'm making my way to that truck and I hear, Pastor Jim. I'm like, ah, oh. I was so close. I was so close. And I'm like, yeah, yes, it's Pastor Jim. All right. So, so they said, hey, uh, I have this song idea. Have you ever heard this song by Hunter Hayes called Dear God? And I went, uh, no. Um, and, but I, I like Hunter Hayes and I like his story and stuff like that. And they said, well, it really goes well with what you're, you've been talking about. And so I got in my truck and I, and I downloaded it on iTunes right in my truck and I listened to it on my way home last Sunday afternoon and it stuck. And then I listened to it over and over and over all, all week long. And here's why, here's why we're going to do that song. Because of the kind of church we are. And let me, let me explain that, right? We're the kind of church, if, if you're here, maybe you got sucked into traffic, you're looking for Walmart. Welcome. All right. Um, wherever you are listening from. Um, but uh, we're the kind of church that calls out the elephant in the room and asks the question that nobody else will ask. Because the reality is sometimes life gets so confusing that that song actually articulates a prayer we have a lot. Hey, God, are you sure you didn't mess up? Now, we've all thought that, but no church will say it out loud. We're that church, all right? There are times in your life and it gets so confusing. You go, God, I know that you're supposed to know everything. I don't think you got this one right. Can we talk about that? And that's what I want to talk about even th- this weekend together. We're, so we're in the, if you haven't been here or you're new to Flatters, um, we are working our way through what's probably uh, the most famous, it's the first full talk recorded in the Bible by Jesus. It's the longest one, it lasts three chapters long. And it's, somebody named it the Sermon on the Mount. This is very creative uh, because it, he, when he gave this talk, he, he wasn't in an auditorium, he wasn't in a temple or a synagogue or anything like that. He was literally out on the side of a hill surrounded by all, all, all these people all right, and so in this opening series, because we're going to be in this series, this, this, these three chapters of the Bible for a long time, and so we're kind of breaking it up into bites. But in this this first series, we've been looking at some like key words and concepts and definition to related related to what Jesus, when he shows up and he announces, he says it basically this: um, "I'm here now, and things are different." Times are changing. It was like this, and now I'm here, and, and from now on it's going, it's going to be different. Different parts of your life can, can actually be different. As a matter of fact, different parts of your life can now be possible where before they weren't. And, and specifically what he's talking about is I want to talk about those parts of your life that are between you and God. Maybe it's looked like this, but now new things are possible between you and God. Or when you look in the mirror and you have all these ideas and definitions, uh, maybe, maybe something better is available to you now that I'm here. Or how about the way that you see and interact with people like that or people that do like that? Whatever that is, now that I'm here, maybe times are changing and maybe that can be different in your world. So here's why, if you haven't been here, I want to do a quick review just so we're kind of all on the same page about uh, what we've covered so far. So when I say something, you'll go, oh, I, I know what he's talking about. So, for example, like, when, whenever, like, whenever somebody was, was asked, like, so what, what did Jesus walk around talking about? Like, I don't know how it works. You know, like, like maybe somebody went to the Sermon on the Mount and they came home and their wife went, so, so what did he say? You know, something like, I don't know. But if you could sum up, like, uh, and you find this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels or the four biographies of, uh, of Jesus. The phrase that kind of summed up, like, what Jesus talked about as he walked around uh, Israel 2,000 years ago was like this. From that time on, and in context here in Matthew, he's just been baptized uh, some time has gone by. He's gathered a few followers around him. He's been speaking and teaching and healing and doing some different things. And then it the, the, comes like this. And then from that time on, Jesus began to preach or to teach. And here's what he was preaching. He's saying things like this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven 
is at hand. So his number one thing is repent, which means you might want to rethink everything. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And at hand means it's now available. It's, it's near. It's always been in existence. But now, because I'm here and times are changing, this kingdom thing, it's available to you. It's available to you. You can live your life with God in his kingdom. See, a person, look at this, a person who's living in the kingdom of heaven, and, and let me just break this down. I'm gonna do this every week for, for a while anyway. When you see kingdom of heaven or, or, or heaven, uh, think, we're gonna try to think like Jesus. He was thinking heavens. So here's what he was not thinking. Like, this is how most of us were raised uh, when it comes to heaven. Heaven is not a Disney castle in outer space and God lives there and after we die, we go join him there. This is what always comes to mind for me since I was a little kid. I, I die and then I go someplace far away where God lives in a, in a Disney castle or something like that. We're done with that. Je when Jesus said heaven, what he's talking about is, is the heavens, as in not outer space, about the space around your head. Right? God is not far away. He is with us. He's right here. You're living in his kingdom where God once done is actually being done. You can live your life there, right? So a person who's living their life in the kingdom of the heavens, which are right here, you'll be living your daily life, look at this, in a, in a, in a daily, like, intimate, conversational relationship. You'll be living your life in friendship with God. With God. And a person who's, who's living in, king, in the kingdom will approach life like, like, and all of its challenges. Because this is, let me clear this up. I don't know what your last churches are like. Just because you follow Jesus and, and live your life in the kingdom, he doesn't put a Jesus bubble around you and keep the boogeyman away. Right? So if you do it right, then nothing bad will happen to you. Not true. And we all have experienced going, that's just not true. But whenever we face challenges and, and all these things that are going to come at us, which we're going to talk about today, we now... We now Approach it from this kind of perspective. Hey, God, I want your will. I want what you want to be done to be done in, in me. That's why we pray in this famous like Lord's Prayer, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount we'll get to. But, but we pray, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get specific about it, meaning this. God, what you want to be done, I want that, exactly what you want to be done, I want that to be done in my marriage not in the universe. I mean, I'm talking about, I want what you want to be done in what's going on between me and my parents or me and my kids. I, I, I want, <laughs> this is a tough one, I, I want what you want to be done to be done with how I spend my money. I know what I want to be done with it. I want to agree with you. I want, I want what you want to be done in my body and to my body and with my body. I, I want the same thing you want for my body that you want for my body. So I'm learning. I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to listen to you. So teach me what needs to change Ready? In me. Now that's really, really important because Jesus doesn't walk around saying, do this different, stop doing that, do that more, don't ever say that ever, ever again. What he says is, I want to do something in you. Because if, I, if he can change something in me, then this is what happens. Then what comes out of me will be better. Not because I try to act different, but because I'm different on the inside. So what comes out of me lines up with what's right and true and good. And this, this, this one word that we've been kind of unpacking over the last couple weeks in here that describes what that kind of life, the state or the condition of, of, of a kingdom with God kind of life looks like is the word that Jesus opens up this famous Sermon on the Mount with. And as soon as it came out of his mouth, I'm sure the entire side of the mountain wrinkled up their head and went, what? Because the word he starts the whole Sermon on the Mount with is this, this Greek word, makarios, Makarios, and, and it, 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 we translate it blessed, like, like blessed are the whatever, but we've expanded on that. Makarios, actually, it's the good kind of life that's possible when a person puts their faith and trust, faith and trust, what do you mean? I have, I have a level of confidence. I'm on the front end of it, or I, I'm way down the road on it. I have some level of confidence in Jesus, that he is who he says he is, and he will actually keep his promise. So I have a, some confidence in Jesus, and I'm now, I, I live my daily life like in the kingdom with Jesus. I have faith and trust in Jesus. I'm living my life with him, with God. And the people that Jesus announces this to, that, that this is available to you. I wanna live life with you. I want you to live with me all through your life in my kingdom. It's to the group of people that most of the world, especially the religious world, but I think even more than that, the people that he's actually talking to thought they would be the last people ever to be invited into anything good in their life let alone the kingdom of God. And the, and the word that we looked at was a Hebrew word. There's this whole class of people that Jesus is saying, I want you in my kingdom. Do you remember the word? Anawim. 
Anawim, all right? And it translates to the throwaway people. I have a, I have a good friend of mine. Uh, he was up in my cabin with me earlier early this week on a retreat. And he said, look at this, Jim. And, and he has, he has Anawim tattooed on his neck. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> That's awesome, Trav. Uh, uh, but part of me wants to do it, but my wife won't let me have it. So anyway, um, but I'm just being honest. So Anawim, the throwaway people. And here's why that's so important is Jesus is not listing how they need to or we need to change how we act. Or if we do this the right way enough times in the right order, eventually maybe we'll earn God's makarios. That's not what he's saying. What he's looking at, he's looking around the side of that mountain in context. He's looking at the messiness and the brokenness there on the side of the hill. And I would even bring that into this because people don't change. He's looking around at this room and our campuses and the people in, in, all over the world in China right now that are staring at a computer screen right now and going, I'm looking at the messiness and brokenness that surrounds me right now in this room and says this, I would, I would like to invite you to be with me. I would like to invite you to live your life with me in my kingdom where new things are possible and no matter where you are hearing, hearing the voice of Jesus right now, you can become a new person. Well, what would, that, what would that look like? Here's what we covered last week. Jesus would say, well, in my kingdom, the, how about this, the poor in spirit. Like, like maybe you look at your, in the mirror and you go, I'm just empty inside and broken and spiritually, I just don't think I have anything to offer. Well, in the kingdom, Jesus says, you'll find Makarios. And you'll be connected to God. Outside, you're just lonely. Or how about this, in, in my kingdom, uh, those who are brokenhearted, because you are, you're mourning the, the most important part of your life, a person, a dream, a career, a relationship, whatever, it died, and you are brokenhearted over it. But in the kingdom, you'll find comfort. Outside the kingdom, you're just sad. Just try to hang on to a memory. How about this, in, in Jesus says, in my kingdom, the meek, right, the meek and the forgotten, like nobody cares about me. In the kingdom, outside the kingdom, you're right, but in the kingdom, you will inherit everything that you need from your father. By the way, his name is God. In the kingdom, those who are starving, like, like hungering and thirsting to see justice and righteousness done and make that fair, but I'm not seeing anything, and it leaves a, like a pit in my stomach. He says, in the kingdom, somehow, Jesus says, I, I'll satisfy that. See, in the kingdom, all of this is possible and promised. Out of the kingdom, you're just on your own. Now, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to look at the rest of these Beatitudes. There's five we're going to kind of go through pretty, pretty quickly today. And I say the five uh, Makarios is available to you, but I want to look at five kinds of people that, that, that Jesus says, if you'll put your trust and faith in me, I can, I, I, can, I can assure you, I can promise you, you can have a Makarios kind of life. Now, here's the thing. Is these five like, kinds of people, when we look at them, you'd go, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, I understand like poor in spirit, that's not a good thing. And, and mourning, that's not necessarily a good thing. And, and, and being dissatisfied on this, that's not a good thing. But, but these things actually look like a good things, right? And you're right, they are. Like, like here's what we're going to look at today. Like being a, a person who shows other people mercy, that's a good thing. All right? I want to be that, all right? Or being a person who has a pure heart, that, that would be good. Better than having an impure heart. Or be, being the kind of person who, who at least tries to see you know, two people that are at war with each other, and trying to step in there and make peace, that, that would be good. How about, how about this is a good, a good person would do this. A, a good person would hang on to what's right and hang on to Jesus no matter what. It seems like those would be good things, and they are. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. Well, how can you say that? Well, remember this phrase? Context is king, all right? You might be right, those are all good things, but context is king. Who is Jesus talking to on the side of the hill? The Anawim, right? Uh, people who conclude that based on my circumstances and how many things have gone wrong in my life, therefore, because everything has gone wrong in my life, I must be a bad person. I'm not a good person. I'm a useless person. God has no use for me. The world has no use for me, and I, I totally get it. I've, I've come to a conclusion that whatever God has promises for, it's for the good people, and, I, and I'm not one of them. Now, again, here's why I say that. People haven't changed. Those people are no different than us. This is why you hear me say all the time up here, please, whenever you read the Bible and see people in there, don't call them Bible people. They're not Bible people. They're just people happen to be in the Bible. But they're just like us. They are just like us. What do you mean? They got out of bed and tried to get their kids to school or tried to meet somebody, tried to go to work, whatever that is. They had things happen to them. They had no idea what was going to happen. And then they run into and encounter this God they thought they had figured out. And he's very different than what they thought he was going to be. And they're trying to make sense of it all. And they jump to some conclusions. The same ones we do. It goes like this. Hey, um, 
I tried to do the right thing. I tried to do the good thing. I went to church and I heard that handsome bald guy talk about what, what come on, what, what Jesus says is a, is a good thing to do. And I went and I tried to do it. And you know what? It got worse, not, get, not better. Anybody? I tried to do that, what Jesus said to do, and it didn't, it didn't get better. It got, it got worse. And it feels like, I'm not saying it's true, but it feels like God isn't helping or doesn't care. So here's what I want to do. I want to go through these five verses really, really quick. And, and this is what Jesus says is true, but I want you to be honest. What, what does that, maybe you've tried some of these before. What does that bring up in you? Because I'll tell you what it brings up in me, okay? And it's not that, that great. All right, so let's look at this first, this first beatitude. So the first one is this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That sounds like a good thing. Here's how it plays out in my life. I, I tried that. I was merciful to somebody. I gave them a second chance. I got taken advantage of. Anybody try to get, have mercy on somebody and they just used it right back against us? I, I've had that. I'm done with that. How, how about this one? Um, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, good for them. Here's what I'm frustrated by, all right? I'm frustrated that the harder I try to be pure, the worse I realize I am. Right? I mean, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to think about pure stuff. I'm not going to think about that impure stuff. I'm going to think about pure stuff. I'm gonna, uh, it's all I can think about. I'm a bad, I guess I'm a bad person. It feels like it's never enough. I try to be pure. I just realize how bad I am. Or how, how about this one? Um, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. All right? Okay. Great. I'm sure that's true. Um, how, how about this? Anybody been to this Thanksgiving get-together? I, I got in the middle of somebody else's fight and got shot from both sides. Anybody? You try to go, hey, look, can I help here? And they both beat me up. They both turned on me. And I was like, you're on your own, sister. Literally. All right, are you on, right? All right how, how about this? <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted. And here's why I'm persecuted. For righteousness sake. I try to do the right thing. Why? For, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I, and I've heard your, some of your stories. I, Jim, I tried to do the right thing in my marriage or whatever that is. And I got punished for it. I was at work. I, got, I was at work, and the way my, my trade works, something like that, they wanted me to you know, cut a corner here or, or not be honest here, something like that, and I said no, and I got fired. I tried to hang on to righteousness, and it, it bit me. Why, why try anymore? How, how about this one? Um, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil about you on account of me. Blessed are you. That's, that's great. And then he puts the icing on the cake. Rejoice. Yippee, I got persecuted, right, right? And, and be glad for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who, who were before you. Now, here's how Jim spiritual math works in this head, okay? I'm not saying it's right, it just is. I'm on meds, pray for me. But here's how I, here's how I think when I hear something back from God. It seems logical to me that if I say, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you, it just seems like his end of the deal is he should make it a little easier, I could do other things. I'm going to follow you. Can, can, can you. can you help me out here, Jesus? I, I've got Bible verses to back it up. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Here's what that means. I'm not going to go with what I was going to do. I'm going to go with you. He ought to smooth out my path. That makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Here's what I've experienced. The more I follow Jesus, this is how it feels, friends, income, and opportunities go down, and insults, isolation, pain, fights, conflict, they, they, they all go up. It just feels, I'm just being transparent here, it just feels like Jesus ought to look out for me a little bit better if I choose to follow him. Doesn't that make sense? It's like that song that the band just played. Dear God, I'm doing my best here. I'm doing the right thing here. So why does it feel like my life hurts so much? Right, or how about this? Um, you said you would take care of me, but listen, um, and I, I know that you know, you're supposed to know all things, but honestly, God, is there something wrong with me, or is it possible that maybe you didn't get this one right? Is it possible that maybe you messed this up? Because it feels like, Again, I'm going to be really honest with you. Sometimes I look back at God and go, this isn't all my fault. Part of this is on you. Now, I'm not right, but that's how it feels. Right? I'll, 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 I'll get very specific. Have you ever looked at God about yourself or somebody else and go, why did you make me this way? Why did you have, make me have, or allow me, whatever, I don't know the right word is. Why, I have these feelings. If you don't want me to feel this way, why don't you make them stop? 
Why don't you take them away? I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing my best, and things are getting worse, not better, and it's really, really confusing. So, so here's my question. Jesus, like, what's going on? And that's a good question. It is a question that Jesus is not afraid of. All right? So let's break this down, and we're going to go through these Beatitudes again, and I'm going to identify some, some key concepts. At the very end, I'm going to have an application, but I'm going to trust that if, if anything kind of connects with your heart, if you'll just ask, God, is, is that what you had me, is that what you wanted me to learn today? And, 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 and he'll teach you what he needs to teach you, okay? So let's break down and define some terms here, okay? The first one was this, blessed are the merciful... For they will receive mercy. And so mercy is a big, a, a big word in the Bible. Let, let me look at another word that's kind of related to mercy. It's the word grace. Grace is, a, is a, a big church word. It's a big Bible word. And it's a wonderful, wonderful word. Grace is giving someone what they don't deserve. And this is the, the big application is we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. All right? He gives us that. All right? Grace is giving someone what they don't deserve. All right? I, I don't deserve the gift of forgiveness. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve. Instead, he gives me that. He gives me something that I couldn't earn and don't deserve, but it's a gift. I'm going to give it to you. That's grace. Giving me what I don't deserve. Now, here's mercy. It's kind of the other side of that. Mercy is not giving someone what they do deserve. What do you mean? I deserve to pay for my own sins. He says, I'm not going to make you do that. The wages of sin is death. Jim, it's either you pay or I'll pay. Let me pay for you. All right? And so, so mercy, probably the biggest kind of illustration of that is if you've ever, you know, you know been, been in a wrestling match or seen wrestling on TV, it's real. All right? Um, but but <laughs> they'll get someone in a headlock or they'll get somebody pinned down, and the, the only thing left to do is they're going to choke out and go unconscious unless the person taps. And that's the signal, Mercy. You could finish me, you could finish me off, I could go unconscious, you could kill me. There's nothing I can do. And the person lets them off the mat and gives them mercy. I'm not going to give you what I could do to you. Now, here's the application of this in this beatitude. This is what I think Jesus is trying to teach us. We give other people mercy. Not, our agenda is not so they'll give mercy back to us. Let me be really transparent. You might give somebody mercy. There is no guarantee anything's coming back your way good. So we give people mercy, not so they give us mercy back. We give people mercy because we have this understanding that we have already received mercy from God. And when we realize how much mercy we've received from God, we think differently because we're trying to think like Jesus, right? We see them differently. I'm going to give you mercy, not because you deserve it, because nobody in my life is saying I should give you mercy. And part of me doesn't want to give you mercy. But in light of my understanding of how much mercy God has given to me, and I'm living in the kingdom now, there. And I may not get anything back from you, but I've gotten already so much from God, I'm going to be fine in the kingdom. And this next one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, shall see God. Pure in heart, that, that'd be a good goal. But again, let's go back to how I kind of touched on a minute ago. Have you noticed that the more, the more you try to be pure, the more all you think about is impurity? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. But I, for example, I can walk in a room and I had no, no plan at all to touch that wall until somebody put a wet paint sign on it. And now I have to. <laughs> yeah, they're right, right, right? I, I don't know what it is about. I, I'll be walking, you know, through the park or something like that. It says, keep off the grass. I'm like, don't tell me what to do, right? And I, <laughs> right? I had no plan to do that, but yeah, I, I, it's just something about me. I'm going to be pure, I'm going to be pure. And it's like, it's like I'm in a hole, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purify myself. I'm gonna, and I dig deeper. And somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking, eventually, if I try to purify myself enough, I'll look in the mirror and went, buddy, you did it. You purified your life. Has anybody purified their life? I mean, I, no. I mean, it's not working out for me. So, so uh, here's, uh, I said this last week, and, and I didn't get any emails about it, so I'm going to say it again. All right? Sometimes when I read the Bible, I look at it and go, if that was happening like right now, without changing the meaning, what, what, what? What would it look like? And so here's Jim's translation of blessed are the pure in heart. Ready? Blessed are the OCD. Okay? Obsessive compulsive disorder. What do you mean, all right? Blessed, I think he's, blessed are those people who are never satisfied. Blessed are those people where it's never good enough. You know who you are. You send the meal back every time because they don't cook it right. Blessed are the people who go to McDonald's and they can't figure out what to get. You drive me nuts. It's McDonald's. Have you not been there before? 
Sorry, that's not even in my notes. That's just true. All right. Um, <laughs> bless those people that feel like I have to do it right. I have to do it pure. And I never do it, and I'm always frustrated. So I have a really good friend of mine who's actually OCD. And I said, so, so tell, tell, tell me about that. Because it doesn't make sense. He goes, time out. It doesn't make sense, Jim. It's irrational. I, you, you can't just look at it and go, stop it. He says, I've tried a million times. I said, well, explain to me what, what it feels like. He says, it feels like if I don't do things the right way in the right order, and what do you mean? Like if I don't touch the doorknob that many times and turn the light on or off that many times, somebody will die. And I'm like, that, that's not you know, sorry, rational. He goes, I know. I know, and it's driving me crazy and everybody crazy. I live my whole life with everybody else's health and wealth and death on the line based on if I am pure enough and if I do it the right way. So, so once I had that understanding, like the lights went on for me, and I'm, and I'm like, so if somebody who's like, ah, it, I've got to have it right, I've got to have it pure. So let me ask you, if someone could find one thing in their life to look at that's good enough, that's pure, that's not pure, that's not pure, that's not pure, that's a mess, that's just oh, impure, whatever it is. But if that, if that person can find one person or one thing in their life to look at and go, and that's good enough, what would it be? And the answer would have to be God. God, I mean, my, my life is a mess, but several times throughout the day, I just gotta come back and go, but God. See, when, when, nothing, when nothing else gives them a sense of safety and peace, it would have to be the face of God who's available in the kingdom. Maybe that would work. Right, so, so uh, my dad, he, he passed away uh, five years ago in January. Um, my dad's favorite hymn, and uh, some of you have never heard of this before. Um, if you're under 50, maybe, I don't know, but um, my dad's favorite hymn was this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I, there's no explanation, but when I just think about Jesus and how good he is, that doesn't matter as much. So if I've touched a nerve and something that you're wrestling with or holding on to or deal with every day, maybe in the kingdom, maybe you could start looking at Jesus. I don't know. How about this one? Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons of God. I, I want to look at this. Peacemaker versus peacekeeper. They're not, they're not the same word. They're not the same, they don't mean the same thing. What do you mean? A peacemaker all right, does what needs to be done, does whatever needs to be done, how hard it is, to bring peace. And peace there is the Hebrew word shalom, and it translates as God meant it to be. When God had an idea and go, this is what I want it to be, that's shalom. And a peacekeeper does whatever needs to be done, a peacemaker does whatever needs to be done to make that happen. I want things to come back together as God meant them to be. Now a peacekeeper, very different. A peacekeeper does whatever needs to be done to avoid conflict and confrontation. I just want the fighting to stop. I don't care if we solve the problem. Just go in your corner, in your room, and let's just get the noise level down. I don't want to fix anything. I just don't want conflict. Right? Now, here's what Jesus says, all right? In the kingdom, a peacemaker, and this is Jesus talking, like, like the identity of a peacemaker, the closest thing he can come up with is himself. A peacemaker is identified as a son or a child of of God, because that's what Jesus did with us. What do you mean? The reason Jesus came here is everything was screwed up, and he says, I've come to bring peace. I, my, my purpose is to bring shalom, what God meant for you to have, back into possibility for your life. So look at it like this, all right? So Jesus, um, in, in those years that he was here, he had in mind the long game, which is shalom. I want, I want you all to have uh, access to peace. You didn't have it. I'm here. Times are changing. Now peace is here. That's my long game. But if you would have checked it with him along the way, you would have looked at him and went, well, you're not doing a very good job. Like, uh, like when your disciples all ran for the hills and denied you. How's that working out for the whole peacemaking thing? No? All right. When they nailed you to a cross, looks like you're failing there. And probably if, if, if you would have tried to think about what Jesus was thinking about hanging on that cross, I bet he was thinking, and it wasn't, but this is what I would put on him. You're, you're kind of getting shot from both sides, aren't you? Your followers all left you, and those people are nailing you to a cross. You, you came here to do something good, and you're getting, you're getting hit from both, both sides. So it looked anywhere along the way, I'm trying to make peace, and it's not working until Sunday morning when he rose from the dead. And everyone went, oh. Because now... What was not available is now made possible long-term for anybody who wants it. You can have shalom in your life, right? See, if, if you're in the kingdom, 
When you're persecuted and holding on to what's right, here's what Jesus says. Persecution and insults and attacks, they will come at you, but those attacks will not be able to undo the good Macarios kind of life that you experience because your blessing and your status with God and your, the answer to the question, am I enough, that's all found from God and not the opinions of other people. That's in the kingdom, out of the kingdom, what people do to you, what people say to you, what th- people think about you, how people treat you back, that defines your life. We get out of bed most of the day going, what will people think about me? What will they, 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 they think that I look like this? They think I act like this? If I do this, what will they do to me? What will they think of me? Right? In the, in, in the world, that, everybody's opinion runs our life. In the kingdom, something higher and better does. So I, I want to take a little bit of a turn here, all right? Because to me, that brings up a, a, a question. Because I hear this all the time on social media and, and from Christians out there wringing their hands about the condition of the world. They're like, oh, Christians have it so bad. Christians are so persecuted. Everybody is, everything is stacked against Christians. We're the most persecuted people ever. Okay, maybe. Uh, here's my question, all right? And I'm really going to talk to Christians here because I like offending you. All right, here's my question. So you're being persecuted because you're a Christian. Are, are, you, are you really, are you actually being persecuted for refusing to let go of what's right, for refusing to let go of Jesus? Is that why you're being persecuted? Or maybe it's this, or because of the way you're acting and treating or speaking to other people in the name of Jesus. Are you really being persecuted because I, I, I will always do the right thing and I will not let go of Jesus? Okay, that's possible. But really, or is it the way you're treating other people and then playing the Jesus card of why you're treating them. All right, so here's what I mean, all right? At the beginning of this series, uh, I said this. Before we even get into these three chapters, I want to make it clear. Th- this, this talk Jesus gave, and this is how I was taught most of my life. It's not like the writers of the Bible like, put together Jesus' greatest hits and crammed them all into three chapters. No, it's, 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 it's one talk that he gave on the side of a hill... And it's one talk, and as he made a point, it set up the next one, and that one was built on one that he had made earlier. So it's a progressive talk leading somewhere. Does that make sense? All right. So if that's true, I want to take what we just looked at and some of the the things that he just said, and I want to jump ahead two chapters to chapter 7, which is the end of it, uh, of this this Sermon on the Mount, all right? And and I want to look at a a, a verse or two that I'm going to be honest with you. I've read all my life, and... And if you just read that verse, it's just weird, if you're allowed to say that. It's very confusing. And, it, and here's what Christians tend to do. We read something in the Bible, we're not really sure what it means, so we make up what it means and then throw it at people. And that doesn't go well, all right? Which means we misapply it a lot. So if you have a Bible, we're, we're going to skip all the way down to Matthew chapter 7. And let me kind of set up this, this weird verse that we're going to look at, and hopefully it will become unweird, all right? So Jesus has just given the part of the talk, and maybe you didn't even know it was in the Sermon on the Mount, but he says this, so you have to stop judging one another because the way you judge her, you're gonna be judged. Why do you spend so much time looking at the speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You're a hypocrite. How about this? Why don't you work on your own plank? And then maybe eventually you'll have something of value to help the person that has a speck of sawdust in theirs. Remember that? We've all heard maybe parts of that before, okay? So he's just said, stop judging him or her. It doesn't help and it doesn't go well. And then he says this. And and also, and do not give sacred things to dogs or throw pearls at pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under their feet and then they will turn and tear you to pieces. Huh? Huh? I get, let's stop judging one another, but why in the middle of this really important part does he give us like pet tips? <laughs> if you have a pet dog or a pig, how about, you know, no, all right. So we look at it and go, that doesn't make sense. So we decide what it means, and this is how I was raised on how this meant. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a mistranslation, and, and, and then it's misapplied in really, really horrible ways. Here's, here's a bad translation of that. Don't waste your time on unworthy, dirty, unclean people, especially those people who do the really gross sins. Listen, they're not worth it. They're like dogs and pigs. And in Jewish culture, that's the worst thing you could call somebody. And that's why they're so hostile to anything having to do with Jesus, because they're worthless. I don't think that's what Jesus means. Well, how can you say that? It's inconsistent with every other thing that came out of his mouth. 
It's inconsistent with the way he treated the Anawim who would fit that, that category. He never did that to him. So uh, let, let me build a little case here and see, and then you can make up your own mind about this. But have you ever tried to, to sit down and explain Jesus and how good he is and what is possible if you were to put your life into the kingdom and, and that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus? Have you ever tried to explain that beautiful concept to your dog or your cat? I don't, don't bother, all right, right, um, <laughs> maybe, all right, and how'd that go? Or how about this, all right, the second part of this, even though you might not be a farmer or a rancher, but you can, you can figure this out, all right, let's say you go out to the barn, because you have pigs, you're raising pigs, and you go out there, and there's your pigs, and you look at your pigs and go, hey, Porky, guess what, surprise, all right, instead of giving you corn or grain or pig food, here's what I did, because this is so important, all right, I went to the jewelry store, and I, bunch of, I bought a bunch of pearls and diamonds and rubies. This cost, this is so valuable. And I'm gonna put that in your food trough instead of food, okay? And then you did that today, and then you do that again tomorrow. Eventually, you're gonna walk in the barn, and what's the response of the pig? It's gonna go with Jesus. He's gonna, because he's, gonna, he's, he's really, really hungry for something that satisfies, and he's gonna walk right on top of those pearls, mash them into the dirt, and then he's gonna look at you and tear you to pieces. Why? Because I can't eat pearls, but I can eat you. <laughs> right? So what, what are you saying, all right? So please hear this. Or hear, and it, out of context, this is, this is really bad. In context, it's really good. So if you're gonna take a picture, Post it in context, all right? Because on, on its own, it's going it's to sound weird. Look at this. Let it sink in. The gospel of Jesus and pearls are true and valuable. But right now, they're in the barn. They aren't helpful. Jesus isn't saying they're not, they're not valuable. He's not saying it's not true. He's saying, given what's going on right now, is, that might not be the most helpful thing. Be, this, is a, this is a parable. This is a metaphor. Well, can you explain it? I'll try. How about this? What is true for a dog or pig's stomach is also true for a person's heart and mind and soul. Jesus is not saying that what he taught us about connecting to God, he's not saying that that's not valuable. He's not saying it's not true. He's not saying it's not right. He's not saying that eventually that might be really, really helpful. Here's the point. Timing is everything. Right? What do you mean by that? How about this? If you do what's right in the wrong way at the wrong time, it won't go well. Have we, anybody experienced that? It's right and it's true. Timing bad and it blew up in my face now so so he starts this chapter with this so stop judging one another and point out everybody's mistakes and, and and ignoring your own that won't go well and then he says and stop shoving jesus down people's throats right so so what are we supposed to do so in context and if each thought builds and it sets up the next one these verses take on a new meaning look at the next things that come out of Jesus mouth okay so you don't want me judging people and you don't want me shoving things on people what do you want me to do i don't know how about ask them a ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be opened and that certainly applies with us seeking god but in context, uh, context what, what, what's it mean? How about this? Rather than shove Jesus down somebody's throat or say, hey, you know, the Bible says that's a sin and you shouldn't do that, and trying try to shove truth on people, how about there may become a time where you, where you say something along those lines, hopefully better than that. But before you do that, how about this? Um, why don't you ask? Ask someone about their life. Ask somebody about their, their story. I, I, wanna, I wanna know about your journey. I don't know your story. And if I don't know your story, here's what I do. I make up a story about you, and that's not fair. Ask, or how about this? Seek, seek understanding. I wanna, I wanna understand what your life looks like and what it feels like and how you got here, because I don't understand it. So rather than just jumping to a conclusion, what, I just wanna know what's going on. How about this? I love this. Knock. What do you mean knock? Why don't we ask permission? to come in and be a part of a person's life in relationship, as opposed to what we normally do. We kick in the door and we, we walk into their life or walk into their house and we force something on them for their own good. And then we get angry and judgmental and say, that, well, they're not worth it because they kicked us out of their life that we were never invited into, right? So let's go back to the Beatitudes, all right? So, so back in, in, in the kingdom, when you try to do the right thing, 
Like bring peace where there's war and things like that. Conflict, when you try to give mercy, hoping that, that people will actually experience mercy. Listen, even if you do it exactly the way Jesus did it, in the kingdom, you're not responsible for anybody's response to Jesus. All right? Way above your pay grade. You're not responsible to convert anybody, convince anybody, guilt trip anybody, force anything on anybody. No, you have nothing to prove based on their response. You have nothing at stake. They have a lot at stake. You have nothing at stake, all right? Not your, not your job, not your responsibility, how they respond. You are responsible for the kind of person that you're becoming and the, and the kind of way that you interact with those people around you. See, all, all you have to offer all I have to offer is, 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 is this. All I know is that Jesus, this is what Jesus is teaching me, and this is the difference that he's made in my life. That's my story. I'd like to hear your story. So I'm asking. Well, what if they, don't, what if they, they say that my story's not true? It's your story. You're not responsible for their response to your story. It's your story. Well, I don't believe your marriage changed. Okay. Still did. I don't believe that you're not addicted anymore. Well, you know, I got 30 days under my belt. I've never done that before. That's my story. Well, I don't know if I believe it's true. Okay. I just like to know yours. Seek to understand and get to know them. How do you get to know anybody? You spend time with them and you share experiences together over time. Just like you're doing with God. It's no different with the people around you. And you gotta knock and ask permission to come in. See, at Flatirons, if you're new to Flatirons, let me explain what kind of church we are. We don't shove Jesus down anybody's throat. It's not our job, right? We just ask, try to ask good questions. And if you'll let, you know, let open the door just a little bit and, and you let, you know, somebody in, um, here's probably what we're going to do. It's probably maybe how you ended up here. Somebody said, okay, that's what's going on in my life. Would you want to, ready, come and see? And, and just make up your own mind about this? Or how about this? Let's just boil it down because Jesus sums up the whole Bible right at the bottom of this part. We're going to get to this in a few months. How about we just approach people like this? Um, uh, just do to others as you would have them do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets. That's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7. That's all I can find Jesus tells us to do. Ask, seek, knock. Don't shove. Don't judge. Just Treat others the way you want to be treated. How, treat others the way Jesus has treated you. Okay, so my takeaway from all that is simply this. Hey, uh, if, you're, if, if, if you're a Christian, even if you're not a Christian, go with this, all right? And you say, Flatterance is my church. Can we start treating people better? Like the way you want to be treated? Can you give people mercy like the way Jesus has given you qu quite a bit? And could we just get off our self-righteous high horse with all our true right answers, stop shoving things down people's throat and just invite them to come be a part of our life? Ask, seek, knock seems much better than breaking and entering and assault. <laughs> right? Um, so then I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with this and this is a shameless commercial plug. We've rearranged our whole church to create these environments and the, the only win in is Ask whatever you need to ask, seek whatever you need to understand, and knock so something opens up. Here, I don't know who said this, so from now on, I said it. It's so good, all right? <laughs> Somehow, God has designed the human heart that the only way it can be opened is from the inside. Isn't that good? I made that up. Not really. Uh, so if, that's what groups are. Groups are a place where you can ask anything you need to ask, seek whatever you need to seek, and try to... Open up whatever he needs opened up without the fear of condemnation, judgment, and I don't like the speck in your eye. We're not going to do that. If it's not too late to get in a group, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what campus you're on, you listen to my voice right now. Go to your lobby or get online and say, I want to I find out more about that because I have a lot of questions. Bottom line, uh, let's stand up all our campuses. Can we just walk out of this room and say, in light of God's mercy towards me, I need to treat people better because of the difference he's made in my life. Can we do that? So God, um, in this moment right now, um, we have a list of people going, except them. <laughs> and probably it's especially them. 
So God, if, if there's anybody in, listen to my voice right now, wherever they are, and, and they're thinking to themselves, that guy just nailed the reason I stopped going to church. It had nothing to do with Jesus. It had to do with the way I was treated. Will, will you just do something in their heart, God, that only that you can do, and, and just um, maybe give them the courage to give this thing another chance. For those of us right now who are even trying to justify what we've done and what we've said to people, and we, I think our hearts and intentions were good. They were, they, were, they were hurting themselves. They were doing things that were going to a bad place, and we love them. And so maybe overzealously, we, we overreacted, and their response wasn't good. So uh, God, our, 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 our intention was good, but our manner was not. And so we want to rethink that. And if God, if, if you'll give us another chance to love them better than we did in the past, kind of like you've loved us, we will, we will try to do it different in the kingdom. Made possible because Jesus is changing who we are on the inside. That's our prayer. I want to, I want to be that kind of man. I want to be that part of that kind of a church that reminds the world of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.